Let's bow our heads for prayer. Beloved Father, what a joy it is to come into your presence with a specific intent of opening your word and hearing your voice. We ask that as we study about Genesis and Revelation's millennium, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to teach us the lessons which will strengthen our faith in these last days. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to begin our study today by turning in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. We've read these verses before, we probably can recite them from memory, but there are four points that I want to underline as we begin our study. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form, that's the first expression that I want us to notice, the earth was without form and void, second expression. And it says, and darkness, that's the third idea, darkness was on the face of the deep. That's the fourth idea, deep, the Hebrew word tehom. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Four ideas. The earth before creation was without form, void, in darkness, and it is described as the deep. And then of course God, which we've already discovered is Jesus Christ, God proceeded to create this world, to put it in order, and to fill it. And I'm not going to read the verses in Genesis chapter 1 that describe the order of creation. I'm just going to mention the verses and also what God did on that specific day. And I'm going to do it for a specific purpose. Of course the first day the Bible says that God made the light. In other words He dispelled the darkness and light appeared. The second day God made the firmament. And basically it's described as God separating the waters from the waters. He put waters under the earth and He put waters above the earth. Above the earth to make the world a gigantic greenhouse so to speak and under the earth to water the earth. Kind of like with an automatic sprinkler system. So He placed water above and He placed water below. The springs of water if you please on the second day. The third day God made the dry land and He also created the trees, the plants, the grass, the flowers upon the earth. On the fourth day we find that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the fifth day God performed two works of creation. He made the fish that swim in the waters and He made the birds that fly in the air. On the sixth day we find that God created the land animals and then finally He created man and woman. And when God finished His work of creation we find that He looked upon what He had made and it was very good. Each day was good, but when He finished the sixth day He saw that it was very good. He had made the light, the firmament, the fertile land, vegetation, sun, moon, and stars, birds and fish, land animals, and human beings. And so the earth was in an orderly state and the earth had been filled. Now the book of Revelation describes seven devastating plagues which are going to afflict this earth shortly be before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Actually the seventh plague culminates with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what these plagues are going to do is they are going to reverse creation. They are going to return to the earth to the condition that it was in before God proceeded to put this world in order before He proceeded to fill it. 
In other words that plagues are to be understood as a reversal of creation and a return to primeval chaos or to primeval disorder. Now I would like us to go in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 4 because that's where the condition of the earth is described in consequence of these plagues in consequence of the second coming of Christ as well. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 19. Here Jeremiah is uh, seeing or witnessing an awesome catastrophic event. It says in verse 19, O oh my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace. In other words, his heart is raging. His heart is beating very fast. He says, because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the what? The sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So notice that what's making Jeremiah's heart beat in his chest is the fact that he's hearing the sound of the trumpet, he's hearing the alarm of war. Now the question is, what event is Jeremiah witnessing in this verse that we just read. Well all you have to do is go to the New Testament and I'll just mention the verses because you know them very well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 says that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the what? And with the trumpet of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 Behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last what? At the last trumpet. And so what Jeremiah is witnessing here is actually the culmination of the period of the plagues. He's witnessing the second coming of Jesus in power and glory. And by the way, the word war that is used in Jeremiah 4 is found in Revelation 19 which describes the second coming of Jesus. It says that John saw heaven opened and on a white horse was seated one who wages war in righteousness and he's coming to punish the inhabitants of the earth, specifically the kings of the earth. So what Jeremiah is seeing here and what Jeremiah is hearing is describing the second coming of Jesus in power and glory which is actually the seventh plague, the culmination of those catastrophes which return the earth to its original primeval condition. Now notice Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. Here Jeremiah goes on to describe what the condition of the earth will be when Jesus comes, when the trumpet sounds and when Jesus comes seated on the white horse to make war with the powers of the earth. It says there in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23, I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. Do you notice three of the characteristics that we found in Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2? Without form, void, and the heavens had no what? No light. In Genesis 1 and verses, verses 1 and 2 we find these three characteristics before the creation of this world. Which means that Jeremiah saw that this world returned to the condition that it was in before God proceeded to put the planet in order and before He filled this world. The world will return to primeval chaos and disorder according to Jeremiah chapter 4. Now I'd like us to notice and I'm not going to dwell a long period of time on these because you can read these verses, you've read them before. I'm only going to refer to some of them, but let's go to Revelation chapter 16 and verses 4 and 5. Uh, Revelation chapter 16 and verses 4 and 5. What I want to show you is that the seven last plagues which take place before Jesus comes, actually they culminate when Jesus comes, actually reverse what God made at creation. Now Jesus made the light on the first day. Is that reversed according to what we just read in Jeremiah 4? The heavens now have no what? 
no light. And so when Jesus created there was light, as a result of this cataclysmic event there is no light. The first day is reversed. Now what about the springs of water that were created on the second day? Notice Revelation chapter 16 and verses 4 and 5. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have judged these things. Notice that the springs of water no longer can sustain life. They are turned into blood. No longer can they help the inhabitants of the earth to survive. In other words, to a certain extent the springs of water are reversed to a condition like they were before creation when they could not serve the purpose of life. Notice Revelation chapter 16 and verse 20. You remember that on the third day God made the dry land. Actually this whole earth is going to be turned upside down. Notice uh, chapter 16 and verse 20 of Revelation. It says there, then every island fled away. In other words they go into the depths of the sea. And the mountains were not what? And the mountains were not found. In other words the surface of the earth is totally uh, broken up and turned upside down so to speak. What God created on the third day for plants and for trees and for flowers has now been reversed to prim primeval chaos. Notice Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 26. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 26. What about the land that has trees and flowers and, uh, and all of these things that beautify the earth and sustain life? Notice Jeremiah 4 once again and verse 26. It says there, I beheld and indeed the fruitful land was a what? a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. What happens to the fruitful land, all of the trees that bore fruit? Everything is turned into a vast wilderness. And by the way, the fourth plague explains why. In the fourth plague the sun scorches the earth with a devastating heat, and all of the vegetation of the earth burns up. And so what God did on the third day is reversed. What God did on the second day is reversed. What God did on the first day of creation is reversed. Now let me ask you, what about the sun, moon, and stars? Do you know what's going to happen to the sun, moon, and stars? Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're dealing now with the fourth day of creation. Matthew chapter 24, and we'll read verses 29 and 30. This is the great discourse of Christ that deals with the signs of the second coming. It says here in verse 29 of Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Let me ask you, what are the powers in the heavens? Actually, you could translate this, the rulers in the heavens. Do you know who the heavenly rulers are? Genesis 1 verse 16 explains that God made the sun to rule the day. And He made the moon and the stars to what? To rule the night. So what is going to happen with the heavenly bodies? They are going to be shaken out of their places by the voice of God. And by the way, that's the reason why when Jesus makes... Uh, this earth all over again, He not only makes a new earth, He makes a new what? He makes a new heavens because He has to put this whole planetary system in order which has been turned upside down by the plagues and by the coming of Jesus. So what God did the fourth day is undone. Now what about the birds? Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4 once again. Jeremiah chapter 4 and let's read verse 25. Jeremiah 4 and verse 25. It says, I, and we'll come back to this first point, I beheld and indeed there was no man and all of the birds of the heavens had what? 
had fled. That means that all of the birds of heaven were gone. What about the fish that God created on the fifth day of creation? Go with me to Revelation 16 once again. Revelation chapter 16 and let's read verse 3. Revelation 16 and verse 3. It says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. How many birds? None. How many fish? None. Sun, moon, and stars? Moved. The fruitful land? A wilderness. No vegetation. The fresh waters which were sustained to, they were to sustain the earth turned to blood. The sun which God created the first day no longer get, uh, the, by the way He did make the sun the first day. I'm not misspeaking because uh, I don't have time to explain it but the sun was there. On the fourth day what God did was synchronize the sun, moon and stars so that they would serve for the months and the seasons. But I won't get into that right now. But there was light the first day. You say how do we know that? Because there was the evening and the morning of the first day. Now I'm, going to, I'm not going to pursue that any further. What I want you to see is that what was done the first day was actually undone because the planet is in darkness. Now what about human beings? We just read in Jeremiah chapter 4 in verse 25 it says that he beheld no what? He beheld no man. In other words there are no human beings on planet earth anymore. In fact what's happened with the human beings? Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25 and there we find the description of what happens when Jesus comes with all of the human beings who are left on planet earth. It says there in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33 and at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. What's going to happen with all of those human beings who are left on planet earth? They are going to what? They are going to die and they're going to be spread all over the surface of the earth from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Is it clear in your mind that the plagues and the second coming actually reverse everything that God made during creation week? Let me ask you how many people are going to be able to live on planet earth during the millennium? How are they going to eat? How are they going to drink? How are they going to live without light? If the world is reduced to pre-creation disorder and chaos this earth absolutely cannot sustain what? Life. It cannot sustain life any more than this world did before Jesus proceeded to put it in order and to fill it. And somebody says, well pastor, but God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. That's true, but that's after the thousand years. It is not before the thousand years. It is not during the thousand years. It is after the thousand years. And so folks, what we find when we compare Genesis with Revelation is that in Genesis, Jesus created this world. He put it in order. He filled it. And as a result of the plagues and the second coming the world will return to the condition that it was originally before creation. Now this is the picture of Revelation 16 and Jeremiah 4. But there is another chapter in scripture that describes this period in a very vivid way. Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24 and I would like to read verses 18 through 20. Isaiah chapter 24, actually before we get to verses 18 to 20, let me give you a little bit of context in the course of the chapter. It says here in Isaiah 24 verse 1, Behold the Lord makes the earth what? Empty. Is that, does that sound familiar? Empty? Okay. Behold the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it what? Waste. Distorts its surface. 
and scatters abroad its inhabitants. We just read in Jeremiah that they're spread out, they're dead, from one end of the earth to the other. Verse 2, and it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth language. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. And now it gives the reason. Notice. Because they have what? Transgress the laws. Is that significant? You know I have a whole one hour presentation just on verse 6. I just have to give you the gist of what we're talking about here. They have transgressed the laws. What else have they done? They have changed the ordinance. I wish I had time to talk to you about the changing of the ordinance. Does Daniel chapter 7 talk about someone who tried to change something relating to time? some scheduled event that comes about every week that's relating to this and then it says change the ordinance broke the what? the everlasting covenant and by the way the covenant in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy is the Ten Commandments Deuteronomy 4 verse 13 says that God gave His covenant even the Ten Commandments in other words what leads to this desolation and this destruction is the fact that people have transgressed God's laws. People have changed God's ordinance which by the way has to do with set times that God has established to celebrate certain events. And they have broken the everlasting covenant of God. That's the reason why destruction comes. And then notice what we continue finding here in Isaiah chapter 24 and I want to read verse 6. Isaiah 24 and verse 6. It says here, once again, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are what? Few men are left. Now we need to stop there just for a moment. Few men are left. We just read in Jeremiah that how many, are, how many men are left? None. Jeremiah says, I looked at the earth, and there was what? there was no man. Isaiah is describing the same event and he says that few men are left. How do we reconcile these two ideas? Well perhaps we need to understand what the word left means. You know it's common among Christians to believe that when Jesus comes in the so-called rapture he's going to take the righteous to heaven and, he's, and the wicked are going to be left on earth. So the left ones are the wicked, and the taken ones are the righteous. Well I have a surprise for you. It's just the opposite. The ones who are taken are the ones who are taken by the destruction. Whereas those who are left are those who are left how? Alive! After the destruction comes. And you say how do we know that? Well let's go back to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7 and verses 22 and 23. You know we have a tendency of forming these traditions and we repeat them year after year after year and many times we don't study for ourselves and so we come with the idea. By the way it's theologically true that when Jesus comes He's going to take His people to heaven. And it's theological, theologically true that the wicked are going to be left behind. But that's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying is that the wicked are taken by destruction and the righteous are left. Now do you remember that Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah so also shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man? Do you remember that also in Matthew chapter 24 it says that one will be left and the other will be what? Taken. Matthew 24 verses 40 and 41 immediately after it describes the second coming. Now who is the one who is left and who is the one that is taken? It has to, we have to go back to study the story of the flood. And you say why? Because in the previous verses it's talking about the flood. 
So if you want to know who the taken ones are and who the left ones are you have to go back to Genesis because it's referring to the flood. Now let's notice Genesis chapter 7 verses 22 and 23. It says about the flood, all in whose nostrils was the, was the breath of the Spirit of life, all that was on the dry land, what? Died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground. What did he do? He destroyed, right? Both man and cattle, creeping thing, and the bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive, says the New King James. Now if you read most modern versions, they'll tell you that only Noah and his family were left. Let me ask you in the flood, who were the left ones? When the devastating destruction came, who were the only ones who were left? Not the wicked, but the what? but the righteous. And so when Isaiah 24 verse 6 says that few men are left, the few men that are left are not the wicked because they're dead all over the surface of the earth. It must be whom? It must be the righteous. And by the way Matthew 24 says that when the flood came it took them all away. So the ones that are taken away are not the righteous, they are what? They are the wicked. So much for the idea that there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture and the ones who are taken are the righteous and the ones who are left are the unrighteous. You can't derive it from this text. And so the few men that are left is referring to those who survive this cataclysmic event the seven last plagues and the second coming of Jesus. They are the ones that we spoke about in our previous lecture. When Jesus comes seated on His throne the question is asked, the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And what is the answer? The answer is, the 144,000 spiritual Israelites who are sealed on the forehead, who reflect the character of Jesus, who mirror the character of Jesus, they will be able to what? They will be able to stand. Those are the ones who are left in the midst of the cataclysmic destruction. Now I want to go a little bit more in detail into Isaiah chapter 24. If you'll go back with me to Isaiah 24, we'll start, we'll jump several verses and we'll go to verse 18. It says, And it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Uh, do you see that people are fleeing here? Are you catching that people are fleeing? By the way, in Revelation chapter 6, are people fleeing when the Lamb is seated upon His throne? Do they hide in the caves? Do they, do they beg for the rocks to fall upon them? This is the same event. It says, For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. This is a global earthquake. And shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be very heavy upon it. And it will fall and not rise again. At least the world as we know it because God is going to make a totally new world. This world will not rise again. And then I want you to notice verse 21. We're going to dedicate the rest of our time to verses 21 to 23. It says there in verse 21, It shall come to pass in that day, which day? Which day has just been described? The day of Christ's coming. When the world is going to be destroyed. When the earth is going to be split open. It says, It shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth. Now modern translations actually have a better rendering of this verse than the King James or the New King James. Actually the best translation I've been able to find is the Revised Standard Version where it says that God will punish the host of the high ones or the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on earth. 
the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on earth. Now do you notice here that we have two groups that are going to be punished when Jesus comes? One is the host of heaven in heaven and the other is the kings of the earth on earth. Now I don't think we have very many problems with the kings of the earth on earth. Because if you read Revelation 19 when Jesus comes seated upon the white horse and the armies of heaven follow him in Revelation 19 and verse 14 we find that later on in the chapter the kings of the earth are standing to fight against Jesus as he's coming on the white horse. And Jesus of course is coming to punish the kings of the earth. So obviously the kings of the earth are the rulers of the world who will be punished when Jesus comes. But we ask the question who are these hosts of heaven that are in heaven. There's a heavenly group which is also going to be punished. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Here we find the identification of the host of the heavenly ones or the exalted ones as the New King James says. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What does that mean we don't wrestle against flesh and blood? It represents humanity. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, Because the children partook of flesh and blood, he also partook of the same. In other words, flesh and blood means humanity, human beings. So the Apostle Paul is saying, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that, against, that is against human beings, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, where? In the heavenly places. So we are not struggling against human beings, we are struggling against powers of wickedness in heavenly places. Let me ask you, who are those powers of wickedness? Ephesians chapter 6 identifies this power as the power of the prince of the air. Satan and his angels are referred to. In other words, Isaiah 24 verse 21 says that when Jesus comes to devastate the earth, he's going to punish the kings of the earth on earth, and he's also going to punish, punish the host of heaven who are in heaven. He's going to punish a group of heavenly beings and he's going to punish a group of humans that live upon planet earth. Now the question is how is he going to punish them? What is their punishment? Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 24 and let's read verse 22. Isaiah 24 and verse 22. It says here in verse 22, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. What is their punishment? Their punishment according to this is that they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. Now allow me to say something about the word pit here. It's a very interesting Hebrew word. And I believe that Isaiah could have used other words. You know there are words in the Hebrew that describe a place where dead people go. The tomb, the grave, Sheol, there are many different words that describe the grave. But Isaiah purposely does not use the normal word for the place that dead people go. He uses a word which is broader in its meaning. Now what, do I, what am I talking about? Well let's notice Genesis 37, 24 and 25, this identical word. Genesis chapter 37 and verses 24 and 25. Here we find the experience of Joseph. His brothers have found him, uh, or he's found their brothers, and his brothers actually cast him somewhere. Notice Genesis chapter 37 and verses, what did I say, 24 and 25. It says here, Then they took him and cast him into a pit. Was he alive or was he dead? So they cast him in the pit in a living state. And the pit was what? Empty. There was no water in it. What was it really? It was a cistern. Verse 25, And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. 
with their camels bearing spices balm and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt and then of course they take Joseph out of the pit now did you see that the pit is a place where he was where he was put in a living state very very important now notice also in the book of Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 6 Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 6 the same idea notice what they did with the prophet Jeremiah Jeremiah 38 and verse 6 it says here so they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon notice it's translated dungeon here not pit but it's also a cistern it says he put him in a dungeon the dungeon of Malchiah the king's son which was in the court of the prison and they let Jeremiah down with ropes and in the dungeon there was no water but mire so Jeremiah sank in the mire that is in the clay or in the mud was Jeremiah put in there in a living state or was he dead he was retained in the pit in a living state but do you know that this word can also refer to a place where peop dead people are retained as well notice Isaiah 38 Isaiah 38 and verse 18 Isaiah 38 and verse 18 it's also used to refer to people who are retained in the pit in a dead state so it's a versatile word it can, re it can refer to a place of retention for the living or a place of retention for the dead now notice chapter 38 and verse 18 it says for Sheol that should be translated the grave cannot thank you death cannot praise you those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth with what is the pit identified it is identified with those who go to Sheol those who are made captives of death is it just so just possible then that when Isaiah 24 verse 22 says that the kings of the earth and the hosts of heaven are placed in the pit that one group is placed in the pit of death so to speak and the other group is placed in the pit in a living state that's what the Hebrew word indicates in the Old Testament I believe Isaiah uses this word because he knew that there were going to be two different groups both were going to be imprisoned but one was going to be imprisoned being dead and the other group was going to be imprisoned being alive now the question is who is the leader of this host of heaven who is going to be punished go with me to Revelation chapter 20 Revelation chapter 20 this is immediately after the second coming of Jesus and we just read in Isaiah 24 about the second coming of Jesus we read in Jeremiah chapter 4 about the second coming of Jesus so this is speaking about the same moment of time notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit terrible translation bottomless pit incidentally it's the Greek word abusos the abyss actually in the Old Testament the equivalent word is the same word that is translated deep in Genesis 1 and verse 2 you say how do we know that the word deep in Hebrew is the same word abusos that we find here it's very simple all you have to do, do is go to the Greek translation of the Old Testament and you want to discover how the word the Hebrew word tehom in Genesis 1 verse 2 which is deep how that word is translated into the Greek in the Greek version of the Old Testament the word is abusos the very word that we have here do you remember the four words that we found in Genesis four ideas in Genesis 1 and verses 1 and 2 without form void in darkness and the earth is described as the deep do we find these same characteristics with relation to the earth when Jesus comes when the plagues devastate the earth absolutely the earth is without form void the heavens had no light and the earth is described here as the deep now notice verse 1 then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key of the, to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand he laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and what did he do with him bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit that means he cast him into the world in a state that it was in before creation because that's what the word means in the book of Genesis are you understanding what I'm saying and by the way the same thing is going to happen to the devil as happened to him at the flood 
How many of Satan's followers remained alive outside the ark when the flood came? Did the devil lose his power base? Were all of his followers dead? Yes. And the saved were where? In the ark. Is it just possible that during the millennium all of the followers of Satan are dead? And the only ones who are alive are the righteous? You see the story of the flood is going to be repeated. As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And you say, well, yes, it says that he has a chain in his hand, and yes, it says that he casts him into the abyss or the bottomless pit or the deep, if you please. And it says that he was shut up, yes. But it doesn't say here that he was cast in prison, like Isaiah 24. Go with me to verse 7. Revelation 20 verse 7 it says now when the thousand years have expired Satan will be released from his prison so who is the host of the high ones who is the host of heaven the host of heaven is Satan and his angels how will they be bound to this earth will they be dead or alive they will be alive what about all of his wicked followers his wicked followers will all be what will all be dead. You know it's interesting in Revelation the way that this is described. Revelation 20 says that at the beginning of the thousand years Satan is bound. At the end of the thousand years he is unbound. You say now how do you understand what that means? It's so simple. Where does the power of Satan reside? If he doesn't have people does he have power? No. And what happens with all of the wicked when Jesus comes? They're dead. So how much power does the devil have? None. But what's going to happen after the thousand years? The rest of the dead, according to Revelation 20 and verse 5, are going to live again. The rest of the dead must be the wicked, because the righteous dead resurrected at the beginning of the thousand years, and were taken by Jesus to heaven. Are you understanding me? So the rest of the dead live after the thousand years, and what does the devil have back? He has his power base back again. So binding and unbinding of Satan has to do with the condition of his power base, the wicked. When they're dead, he's bound. When they're alive, he is what? He is unbound. It's that simple. Now, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 24. And let's read the last part of verse 22. Isaiah 24, 22. Let me ask you, is the millennium clearly taught in the Old Testament? Yes or no? See, you, you go to Revelation 20 and if you don't go to the Old Testament you have a very incomplete picture. But when you go to Genesis, you go to Jeremiah, you go to Isaiah, and you compare Revelation 20, everything makes sense. Now notice Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 22 again. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and will be shut up in the prison and now notice after many days they will be punished now whoa let's stop there after many days they will be what? who will be punished? the kings of the earth and whom? and the host of heaven after many days, how many days is many days? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that the many days are a thousand years. And by the way, we've always believed in the year-day principle in the interpretation of Bible prophecy. In prophecy, days are equal to years. Here you have the proof. Some people say, why don't you have, why don't you apply the year-day principle to the thousand years of Revelation? Why don't you say that that's 360,000 years? It's very simple, because the Bible itself gives us the year-day principle. In Isaiah it says days, in Revelation it interprets those days as years. So when you go to Isaiah, the days in Revelation are explained as years. So you don't have to use the year-day principle in Revelation, because Isaiah uses a year-day principle. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, after many days they will be punished. How many stages does the punishment of the wicked have? Now you have to be a careful reader to catch this. Are they punished when Jesus comes? When they're thrown into prison are they punished? Did we read it? Sure! Verse 21 and verse 22 says that they are punished. They're cast into prison or into the pit. Stage number one. 
But did you notice here that it says that after many days they will be punished? So is the first punishment their permanent punishment? It can't be. Because after the many days they are what? After the many days they are punished. In other words, the punishment of the wicked has how many stages? It has two stages. The punishment of Satan has how many stages? Two stages. Is the devil destroyed when Jesus comes? Do the wicked receive their reward when Jesus comes? No. Now, I want you to notice that the wicked suffer two deaths. The two deaths are related to what we're talking about. You see, when Jesus comes, all of the wicked, what? Are slain. They all die. Are you agreed with that? There's not one person alive on planet earth. The few that are left are the saved. But of the wicked, no one is left. They're all dead from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. So they died, either before Jesus came or at the moment that Jesus came. All of the wicked are dead. Is that their final death? Is that their final punishment for sin? No, because after the thousand years the rest of the dead live again. And then they're judged. According to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, they're judged. And then they suffer what the book of Revelation calls what? Second death. You cannot have a second death unless you have a first death. So do you see, this is so simple that when Jesus comes all of the wicked die. They remain prisoners in the pit in a dead state for a thousand years. After the thousand years they come to life again and then they're punished with second death. Satan and his angels are punished when Jesus comes. They are put in prison in a living state. And after the thousand years they receive their final what? They receive their final punishment. Is this clear to you? It's so simple. How many people are going to live on planet earth during the thousand years? If you can call the devil and his angels people, they would be the only ones that are going to live here. Who else could live here? Can this earth sustain life? It's impossible. Everything has returned to the way it was before creation. Without form, void, darkness in the heavens, a desolate wilderness. Described as the deep, as the abyss. There's no way that human beings could live on planet earth if creation has been reversed. Now let's go quickly to Isaiah chapter 24 and let's read verse 23. Notice what happens after the many days. It says in verse 23, then, that is after the many days, then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. What is this? After the many days it says that the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and where? and in Jerusalem. What's seen after the many days? Mount Zion and Jerusalem. And what happens with the sun and the moon? They are disgraced and they are ashamed. What does that mean? Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 21. What comes down from heaven after the thousand years? Is it Jerusalem that comes to view after the many days, after the thousand years? Absolutely. Revelation chapter 21 and let's read verse 2. It says, Then I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And now let's jump down to verse 23. It says in verse 23, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illumined it, and the Lamb is its light. So what does it mean that the sun and the moon are disgraced and ashamed? It's because the Lord sits in Jerusalem on Mount Zion and His light is so great that the sun and the moon have to step aside. Now understand me, it doesn't say that there will not be any sun or moon because we are going to have a, a monthly cycle. Because we will go from month to month to eat from the tree of life. There is a weekly cycle because we are going to go from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord. Let's read the text carefully. The text says there in the city, not all over the earth, in the city there is no need of sun or moon. It doesn't say that there isn't a sun or moon. They're simply ashamed and disgraced before the glory of God. 
And then of course the wicked surround the city and the devil his angels and the wicked are destroyed by the fire that comes down from heaven. And then God will make a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I'd like to ask the question, where will God's people be during the thousand years? <laughs> Fundamental misunderstanding of, of Christians today. They say, they say Jesus is going to come in the rapture. And he's going to take his people to heaven for, th for seven years. And then he's going to come back in his glorious coming and he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. Not possible. Because Jesus said very clearly in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, take you to my Father's house, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where is Jesus going to take his people when he comes? He's going to take them to heaven. They're not going to be in heaven seven years. How long are they going to be in heaven? They're going to be in heaven for a thousand years. By the way, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 makes it very clear. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus doesn't come all the way down. We are caught up. Because he's going to take us to the Father's house. Are you following me? By the way, in Matthew chapter 29, in verses 29 to 31, it says that when Jesus comes, he is going to send forth his angels to gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. If he's going to come all the way down to the earth, why bother to send his angels to gather them? The Apostle Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Five speaks about our gathering together to Him. Not Him to us, but us to Him. In other words, the churches have it wrong when they say that Jesus is going to come in the rapture, His people will be taken to heaven for seven years, then He's going to come back to this earth and establish His everlasting kingdom here on, uh, on earth, beginning with a thousand years of peace and prosperity. How could anybody live here during the thousand years? If the earth has been devastated, and a new heavens and a new earth have not been created yet. By the way, do you know why the devil wants people to think that uh, Jesus is going to spend a thousand years on earth? I'll go through this quickly. 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the devil is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. He's going to appear like Christ. Like a glorious being, he's going to perform miracles. He's going to speak many of the words that Jesus spoke while he was on earth. Let me ask you something. If you believe that when Jesus comes, He's coming to live on this earth and to set up this kingdom on earth for a thousand years, will you probably buy what the false Christ is teaching and what the false Christ is doing? Sure, because you're expecting Him to come to this earth. But if you know that Jesus is not coming to this earth, at His second coming He remains in the air, than any being who appears walking upon planet earth speaking the way Jesus spoke performing the miracles that Jesus performed you know that it is not Jesus because the millennium will not be spent here the millennium will be spent where? the millennium will be spent in heaven with Jesus and do you know what we're going to do during the millennium? go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 it's going to be a working vacation. <laughs> Have you ever taken a working vacation? All my vacations are working vacations. My family can tell you that. I get scolded for it. Well deserved, well deserved. 1 Corinthians 6, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? By the way, the world means worldlings, the lost, the unrighteous. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? And now notice, do you not know that we shall judge angels? 
What are we going to do? Judge angels. Which angels? The good ones, right? Why would we have to judge the good angels? It must be that we are going to judge the evil angels. And Revelation 20 and verse 4 says that God's people who resurrect at the beginning of the millennium reign with Christ a thousand years and judgment is given unto them. In other words they are given the capacity to judge those who are left here on earth dead. Those who have been overtaken by destruction will be judged in heaven. And the punishment of each will be written in the books. And after the millennium when the wicked resurrect, when the devil and his angels rally the wicked against the city, God will show the life of each one of those people who are outside the holy city. And he will show the sentence which was determined for them in the heavenly court during the thousand years. And Revelation 15 says that they will say, Just and true are your ways, O God. And they will be destroyed by their own request. And then God will make a new heavens and a new earth. And the meek shall inherit the earth. And we shall live with Jesus forever and ever. And He will wipe away all tears. And He will remove death forever. 